Good morning, everyone. This is Aaron Strong. Um, welcome to the second Ocean and Coastal Acidification Monitoring Webinar on Calibration Collaboration. We're going to get started in just a few minutes. Um, thanks so much for joining us. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our second Ocean and Coastal Acidification Monitoring Webinar. Uh, my name is Aaron Strong. I'm an Assistant Professor of Marine Policy at the University of Maine, and this is the second in a two-webinar series. Um, the previous webinar was on March 30th, and uh, if you attended that, um, welcome back. And if you did not attend that webinar, you can find it available um, on the NECAN website, NECAN.org. Uh, the topic of today's webinar will be calibration and collaboration. Uh, we are going to dive into the details of the uh, new EPA guidelines for monitoring coastal acidification uh, with Jason Greer and Adam Pimenta, the authors of those guidelines, um, who will present. Uh, before that, we're going to hear from Jackie Motika at Nirkus and NICAN, um, who's going to talk a little bit about data sharing and building a network of citizen science data monitoring. These webinars are part of a grant from the NOAA Ocean Acidification Program to Beth Turner uh, at the NOAA National Ocean Service in Portsmouth. Beth is the lead PI. Co-PIs on that grant include myself, Esperanza Stanshoff at UMaine Cooperative Extension and Maine Sea Grant, Rue Morrison at the Northeast Regional Association of Coastal Ocean Observing Systems, NIRACUS, and Parker Gassett, also at the University of Maine. Um, that team has been uh, joined by Katie O'Brien Clayton, Kristen Bannock, and Carolina Bastidas in Massachusetts and Connecticut. And the purpose of this grant is to build a network uh, and support programming uh, and training for citizen science groups who are interested in monitoring coastal acidification uh, in the Northeast region. Um, we recognize that there are many different reasons that people engage in water quality monitoring and many different motivations for monitoring ocean acidification. In our first webinar, we described the problem of ocean and coastal acidification, which many people are familiar with, 
Uh, and we focused on some of the reasons why it is important to develop a network of monitoring so we can actually gain more information about the drivers of coastal acidification uh, in our system. And part of the reason for doing that is that in order to manage, mitigate, or adapt to ocean and coastal acidification, we need to understand its dynamics. Uh, there are many reasons why you might want to monitor acidification. Um, part of a long-term monitoring site, uh, that data is incredibly valuable. You might be motivated by the impacts of acidification on commercially important shellfish species, um, or there might be a specific decision point or water quality decision point that you're interested in informing. And we recognize the diversity of reasons and uh, diversities of sort of levels of monitoring uh, within the audience. Um, the way this is going to work today is we'll have two short presentations. Uh, after that, we're going to leave about 30 minutes for questions and answers. And the way questions and answers work um, is that you type your questions directly um, into the GoToMeeting questions tab that you'll see on the right of your, your webinar screen. Um, we will collate all of those questions and offer them to our panelists. So I will actually read the questions and who they're from to our panelists um, who will then uh, try to answer them. Um, you know, everyone on the line um, will be muted, but if you'd like to sort of have a back and forth, we can unmute you if that becomes uh, relevant. So please do use the question box. Um, that's how we have the exchange of information uh, here today. Um, so thank you again for, for joining us. And I'm now going to hand things uh, over to Jackie Motika. Jackie is the operations manager at NIRACUS and the coordinator of the Northeast Coastal Acidification Network, NECAN. Um, and I'll note that unfortunately, Rue Morrison is under the weather today. So thank you, Jackie, um, for, for, for stepping in. Sure, I'm happy to. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining. Um, so uh, what I'm going to do is just give um, a short presentation on how you can align your mission with data sharing and how to do more with the networks. So just a basic overview of how the presentation is going to flow. I'll give a brief introduction of NERACUS, how to access some of our data that might be of particular interest and then show some of the results from the survey that we distributed earlier this winter um, and how these efforts can work together. So NERACUS is part of NOAA's Integrated Ocean Observing System, or IUS, which is a federal program, but what makes it unique is that it's stakeholder driven and within each region. So NERACUS, as part of this, is the Northeast region of the Integrated Ocean Observing System. What each of these different regions do is that they pull in information from a variety of different observational assets. So we have a few here. We have buoys, which we deploy quite a few of in the Northeast. Uh, gliders, which are like ocean drones, tide stations, satellites, um, as well as models. And what each region tries to do is they try to fund certain assets that are of the greatest use to the region and then pull it all together so everyone can access that information. Naracoos, as I said earlier, is the Northeast region. So we span from Long Island Sound up in through Canada into Nova Scotia. And within the Northeast region, Naracoos funds a variety of assets. And this is just a quick snapshot. We don't need to go into any of these details, but just to show you some of the different groups that we do fund. And these are the groups that own these these assets and really put out the information. So now I'm going to switch gears a little bit about how to access this information as well as some of the information that some of our partners put out. All of this information is available on the NERACUS website and first I'm going to walk through an example of how to access the real-time data. So this map shows all of the different observational assets that NERACUS pulls into um, its system. And by clicking on any one of these little circles, you can access the real-time information. So the one I chose here is the Coastal Marine Lab outside Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Um, and I chose this particular one of interest because it's a coastal environment. And you can see here in the data that's displayed, I'm sorry if it's a little tiny, um, 
Joe Salisbury collects um, CO2 and pH and total alkalinity at this asset. So this is something that anybody can access um, and use to, to benefit their own efforts as well. And if you wanted to know a little bit more about this station or more detail about the data, you can also do it below in any of these hyperlinks. Um, next, I want to just talk about how to access some of the historical data. And there are a few different ways to do this, but I think this is kind of the best way to get a really real-time shot of what's going on in the ocean environment. So I'm going to show the ocean climate product. And it just takes you to this welcome screen. So on here, you can choose the buoy location or one of the other assets, the data type that you're of most interest to. And if you're looking, it says averaging time period. So you can look at a monthly average as well as a daily average. So I chose um, a buoy up in Penobscot Bay this morning and looked at the salinity at 50 meters. And at each buoy monitor different types of parameters. Um, but you can see here that there's a variety of these that might be of particular interest in the coastal environment. And I also chose um, daily. So what this, what this graph is showing is the yellow is the range of, the inf of salinity measured at this buoy um, over the last 10 years. And then the blue line is the mean or the average of what the salinity is at this particular depth. And then the orange dots show the actual real-time salinity at this location. So you can see as of this morning, the salinity at, in Penobscot Bay is below average. Um, I also chose the same buoy to look at water temperature this morning. And at the same depth, the water temperature we can see is, is above average, um, not quite out of range of what we've seen historically. But earlier uh, in March, we can see that that was, that was the highest temperature we've recorded at this buoy. So I think that the, this display is a great way to just quickly capture what are we seeing? Is this normal? Is this what we would expect on this particular day or this particular month? So as I mentioned earlier, I wanted to briefly show some of the results from the survey that was distributed earlier this winter. Thank you to everyone that participated. We heard from a range of groups and these, this is a, a high level overview of all the groups that we heard from. We heard from 58 in all. So thank you very much for your participation. Looking at what everyone is monitoring throughout the region, we can see that there's a lot of efforts already occurring in the region. Um, primarily temperature, salinity, oxygen, and a, quite a bit pH as well. And so what this really shows us is that there's this broader network that exists besides the traditional um, data streams such as Naracus is producing. And some of the data that's being collected um, by the by the different various citizen science groups um, in the survey we learned that other groups are using this information as well to inform their own results and monitoring efforts and these are a few and in terms of ocean and coastal acidification policy and management it's most important that we have this this fine scale research and that we're sharing the data that we are collecting because all of it makes a difference and all of it tells its own unique story. So working together with each other, um, bringing these different data types together, we can really start to make a difference and learn more. And a great place to have these types of conversations is on the Ocean Acidification Information Exchange. This is a new website that was recently launched. I have the link above, www.oainfoexchange.org. And what this site does is it allows you to have conversations with anyone that's doing any type of ocean acidification work anywhere in the country um, and even internationally. So if it's about a, if you're interested in a particular topic or a specific type of monitoring, these conversations can be had here. And it's, it's essentially kind of a Facebook for ocean acidification conversations. So I would encourage you all to go on this website 
Um, and if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me at any time. Great, thanks so much, uh, Jackie, for that wonderful overview of Niracus, the assets, how to access data, uh, and certainly the inv invitation to join the OA Info Exchange. Next, we're gonna hear from Jason Greer and Adam Pimenta. Jason Greer is a research ecologist at the National Health and Environmental Effects Research Lab um, at EPA uh, in Narragansett. And Jason and Adam are the authors of new guidelines for measuring changes in seawater pH. And Jason's gonna give an overview of those guidelines and then Adam will be available to follow up and they'll both be available to answer questions about these brand new guidelines. Thanks so much and take it away, Jason. Thanks, Aaron. Um, thanks for the opportunity and uh, and thanks uh, thank you to you and uh, the rest of the organizers on the on the mini grant for the patients while we get these guidelines done. Um, it's a little different from a typical EPA research product because it has received agency level review and and that has contributed to some of the some of the time it has taken. But we're excited to say that we're actually expecting a shipment of the guidelines to uh, here today. <laughs> expecting a box to appear in the mailroom any minute. Um, so I'm excited to talk about them. Adam Pimenta is also on the line. Um, hopefully he'll have an opportunity to participate in the discussion afterwards. Um, so I wanna start right out by um, talking about why EPA is interested in this problem of coastal acidification. Um, probably the, the clearest statement is that we know that sensitive life stages of wild and farmed uh, coastal organisms often occur during uh, periods when when pH uh, ex reaches its lowest extremes. And that some of the drivers of these extremes and patterns in pH are land-based. So a lot of our activity, my primary research area in EPA is, in, is under the National Water Research Program. So most of our, uh, most of the EPA activities related to this problem right now are, are um, linked to the Clean Water Act. And that means that uh, our research is intended to inform how some of those land-based drivers might, might be used to, uh, to, as, to respond to the problem of coastal acidification. So then a, a major third point is that uh, there are big sampling gaps in the observing programs. Um, so there are observing programs that are out on the coastal shelf but, but further inshore, the, the observing efforts are much more distributed and, and also therefore much less uh, well linked together. Um, fewer of the large uh, federal observing programs cover those areas. Um, so hopefully, at least those of you that uh, listened in on the first webinar, hopefully a lot of you have seen this figure. Um, and I, I, basically, this is our understanding of this is a this is where a lot of our concern about ocean acidification comes in. You can see the 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 red line is the atmospheric CO2, and then the blue line is the partial pressure of CO2 in surface water. This is um, at the Mauna Loa and and nearby ocean waters, uh, Mauna Loa Station in Hawaii. And then the green line shows the declining pH. So this is what we are actually seeing in the ocean. In the coastal environment we don't really know we don't have a, that a similar similarly clear idea of how coastal acidification is changing ph and right now they're even even distinguishing the difference between these scenarios or distinguishing between these scenarios in the coastal environment is difficult we don't know for example in a particular coastal site whether to expect ph to just simply be lower all the time than it would be without coastal acidification or if the extremes in pH, the, 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 the red line in the middle plot here, whether, whether that's the scenario, or whether we just have a larger amplitude in the swings of pH. And the reason why these complexities tend to exist in the coastal environment is basically because of all the biological activity. It's much more biological activity in the coastal environment, and we really don't have a clear idea of how that's going to affect pH patterns or, or patterns in coastal acidification. So just looking at an example of some data from uh, the, the paper by Wallace and others came out a few years ago. Um, 
these are data from Long Island Sound, and in the top panel, you can see pH variation. The dark black, the, the heavy black line, is the pH variation over over two years. You can see the strong seasonal pattern in that variation. And that's at the western end of Long Island Sound, where there's much more nutrient enrichment. <clears throat> at the eastern end of Long Island Sound, you you see a much flatter dynamics. Uh, the, the amplitude of that seasonal dynamic is much lower. And, and also notice that on the, the, the scale in the pH is on the NBS scale, <clears throat> which is the same scale that one would normally use with a handheld pH meter. And so the major point I want to drive home with this is that these are really valuable insights about carbonate chemistry in Long Island Sound that come from measurements that are done on, an, on the NBS scale. Now, these, are, these observations were all done by one group, and they used, they were, they used very well calibrated pH meters. Um, and so this kind of exemplifies the kinds of, of uh, insights one might gain if you have well-coordinated pH observations. Um, so the other point I want to want to draw your attention to here is that the oxygen patterns are also shown. And if we, ha if we have data like this, we can begin to ask questions like, how much of this dynamic is driven by the biology within the coastal environment, and how much of it is driven by influx of, of water from the ocean? Um, when you start to see um, dissolved oxygen and pH tracking close together, it, that makes sense because uh, dis the consumption of dissolved oxygen produces CO2 that drives pH downward. But if you start to have more contribution from ocean acidification, from waters coming in at the boundary, you might begin to see these, <clears throat> see different kinds of patterns between pH and dissolved oxygen. So that's sort of a long-term view of how measurements of both of these parameters can help us start to tease apart the drivers of, of coastal acidification. So in response to the need for, for these kinds of measurements, for exactly those kinds of measurements that I just showed you and recognizing that there are a lot of people that are interested in, in, in getting this kind of information, we started to put together these guidelines a couple of years ago. Um, and uh, the, the main purpose of the guidelines was to, to basically to give an overview of available approaches. Um, it's too soon to be prescriptive about exactly what kinds of approaches are always best at every site. Um, and then also to facilitate development of compatible data sets to do the kinds of comparisons that I just showed you for Long Island Sound. Um, and the audiences uh, are basically shellfish hatcheries, growers and harvesters, citizen scientists, and, but, as, but also laboratories interested in expanding their, their maybe, they, maybe a laboratory has an existing water quality monitoring program and wants to just expand its capability to include carbonate chemistry. So when we started putting t these together, um, you know, it was obvious that there were, there were already some existing very good guidelines about how to do this kind of work. Um, and three of the important ones are shown here. The one on the left is the Dixon Handbook, Dixon and others. Um, the one in the middle is the one from Europe. And then this third one over on the right is from the California Current Acidification Network, or CCAN, which was, I believe, the first CAN, the first coastal acidification network, that, that I, at least that I'm aware of. So here are these three um, documents, and <clears throat> that first one is basically focuses on measurements, and it, also, it is also pretty heavily focused on doing highly precise measurements in the open ocean. Some of these methods go back many decades and were refined by people interested in, in uh, global carbon budgets and, and ocean exchange with the atmosphere. <clears throat> Has very concise standard operating procedures, very concisely written and therefore not incredibly detailed in terms of the kinds of situations that a specific laboratory might run into. So they end up <clears throat> being a good starting point if you're a laboratory that's got a, a particular set of instruments uh, and, and you, know, you, you need to figure out basically the minimum requirements. The one from Europe focuses on basically on methods to use in laboratory and field experiments but it has a, a very good discussion of uncertainty for, for different measurement options. And then this third one from California 
um, um, basically the way I look at that one is that because of its geographic focus, it, it did allow a, a more prescriptive approach in developing recommendations. And they grouped those recommendations into principal recommendation. That's basically the one they want their participants to use. And then there are more economical or cheaper alternatives. And then the cutting edge ones for groups that might be collaborating with, with uh, university researchers, for example. But, but importantly, that, uh, that, that very important document acknowledges the challenges of, of applying some of these methods on the U.S. East Coast. And um, as I mentioned, a lot of the challenges in, in going from an oceanic environment to, uh, to an environment like the East Coast, where we have lots of rivers and different sort of alkalinity considerations, lots of enriched systems, <clears throat> we have all these other factors. All of these factors are important you know, everywhere in terms of carbonate chemistry, but their relative importance on, on the East Coast is different, for example, from the West Coast or, or from the Gulf of Mexico. So this is just showing you the table of contents from, from the guidelines document. Um, and just as an example, the factors contributing to acidification is broken down into these, and each of these, there's a paragraph or two just giving a basic overview of each of these factors. Um, and then we give an overview of the seawater carbonate system. It's the same type of overview that's contained in all of the other documents that I just mentioned, but perhaps a little bit more relevance to the coastal environment. Um, I think what a lot of people might find useful is the detail that we get into on collecting bottle samples. There are SOPs in the, in the Dixon document for how to collect a bottle sample, but we just take it to a, a more detailed level getting into cleaning, the different types of bottles that one might use, types of sampling equipment that you can use, that kind of thing. Um, and we have a, in, included in the guidelines, we actually have a checklist that's intended to kind of help people develop their field protocols um, for each of the steps and considerations for collecting a bottle sample. Um, our work here tends to be very focused on bottle samples rather than field sensors. So we were in a bit more position to, to offer insight on, on, on those practices. Um, we also have an overview of sampling concepts and, and, and uncertainty concepts with figures like this one, getting into the difference between precision and accuracy. You know, one of my sort of mantras is that a poor measurement with good documentation of uncertainty is, is better than a great measurement with no documentation of uncertainty. Um, and this tries to capture some of those concepts. We also talk about data quality objectives, and that's basically derived from the this uh, website here down at the bottom right, the Global Ocean Acidification Observing Network. Um, and we borrow heavily from that. This is a, a, a screenshot directly from that um, uh, website with these with emphasis added here. Um, with the main point being that climate quality data refers to da measurements that are intended to assess long-term trends with a defined level of confidence. In other words, multi-decadal timescales. Whereas weather quality data is more like the types of data I showed you for Long Island Sound that allow you to look at patterns, short-term patterns, patterns within a system, seasonal patterns, that kind of thing, spatial patterns, and so on, and 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 facilitate understanding the drivers of those patterns. So even if your your interest is, interest is in ocean acidification, weather quality observations can be useful for understanding the mechanisms of ocean acidification. And then to just uh, take some of the information from the GoOn website and give it in a tabular form here. So the way they describe uncertainty is they describe them in terms of the objective of estimating carbon ion concentration uncertainty this top row. So the weather objective would be, the weather, the weather data objective would be to estimate uh, carbonate ion uncertainty uh, within 10%, or to estimate the, the, the concentration within an uncertainty of 10%. And then the climate quality objective would be to do the same thing within 1%. And, and so in order to achieve those objectives, <clears throat> and let me just say briefly that the reason why carbonate ion concentration is is important is it's, it's one of the components of the carbonate system that is extremely biologically important because this is the 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 component that relates to things like um, 
the avail availability of raw materials that marine organisms use for building shells and other structures. <clears throat> so, so in order to achieve those levels of of certainty, your pH measurement would be need to be, would need to be made within 0 0.02 pH units. But for the climate data quality objective, you would need an uncertainty of 0 0.003 or better. Um, so that's quite a big difference in uncertainty there. And then for doing alkalinity and DIC measurements um, of the sort that you would do from bottle samples, um, you can see here that that the uh, tolerated uncertainty for weather uh, for the weather objective is five times larger than for the climate objective. Um, and then the sort of the the ability to do these kind this kinds of work is shown on these bottom two rows according to um, this document the uh you know the weather objective is achievable for competent labs um and and uh and then for autonomous sensors it, it can only be done with the very best uh, of the autonomous sensors and then um for the climate quality objective that, that's even fewer labs that are capable of reaching that objective and the autonomous sensors are very rarely suitable for that uh, okay so um, this is a table from the guidelines that we developed from from some of the documents that I mentioned, sort of collating information. And you can see here, uh, as an example, just out looking at the top row, um, so for an estimate of total pH that's done on a spectrophotometer, um, you can expect a measurement of uncertainty of about 0 0.005. And when you combine that measurement with uh, a measure with some of these other measurements over here on the right, the numbers in the boxes give you the relative uncertainty for estimating carbonate ion concentration. So what you're looking for on a table like this, if you're trying to figure out, let's say you're in the position to do two parameters in your observing program, you're looking for the lowest number in this table. There are other, this is a this is kind of a, an, a, a somewhat of an oversimplification of the factors that one would consider, but it's a starting point because obviously there are things like cost, there are characteristics of specific ecosystems that make some of these sensors less appropriate than others. But as an example, you look look down at the bottom right, you see that 1.7 there. That is basically suggesting that if you can do DIC, um, you know, a high quality measurement of DIC and a high quality measurement of alkalinity in the column, you know, the column heading there, you can see alkalinity there. That's that's going to give you your lowest uncertainty for estimating this important. Uh, parameter uh, important in terms of biology. Um, so, and, and sometimes when these tables are put together, they come out a little bit differently because people use, <coughs> excuse me, have different assumptions about the the the, the difficulty of of obtaining a good alkalinity or DIC measurement. Um, so, for example, the McLaughlin paper. Uh, McLaughlin report I mentioned earlier actually has has a different outcome in their analysis. So another um, component of the guidelines uh, that I think people find useful is that we lay out these four equipment scenarios um, just sort of to try to capture the spectrum of different situations that people might be in as they consider doing this kind of monitoring. So one example would be a water quality research laboratory. And so in that part of the document, we give a very long list of all the equipment that's involved with having a good carbonate system monitoring effort. Um, there's a lot of little pieces of equipment and safety equipment and sampling equipment that, that uh, you know, you don't necessarily think of when you first contemplate these kinds of measurements. And then there's the single instrument, you know, example of a, you know, if someone was interested in acquiring a single ins instrument, they, they already had some skill in, as a basic water quality laboratory. Then there's uh, what we're, we're seeing more commonly right now is uh, the example of a monitoring effort with external laboratory support. So you might have a sensor or a, or a pH measurement effort, and then you, you have additional support and collaboration with a laboratory that gets ground truthing samples for you every once in a while. And then another example is the shellfish growers and hatcheries. Um, Adam and I both remember an experience where we visited a hatchery quite a few years back, and we were talking about carbonate chemistry with the operators of the hatchery, and they said, oh, well, we've been measuring pH here for decades because it's how we monitor the condition of our upwellers. 
and whether um, the conditions are right for larval survival. So a lot of growers and hatcheries already have pH meters in hand and are interested in how their measurements can contribute to this larger effort. So I want to just give a quick scenario of, of how uh, a pH, you know, I know a lot of organizations are facing the real, reality that pH may be ambitious in and of itself or may be the only measurement that, that they can take on right now. So what if you have a pH measurement? So this is a figure showing uh, <clears throat> pH against total alkalinity and how different combinations of those two characteristics lead to this availability of biominerals. So the color is, the, is basically the aragonite saturation state, and the black line going diagonally across the figure is where uh, it is the boundary between corrosive and non-corrosive uh, environments. So for example, uh, going to the next slide here, if you had a pH measurement um, of, uh, well, let's say you have information externally on alkalinity, which actually EPA is, is, is trying to begin gathering. Um, we have a proposal actually in the works on, on get, doing a broad scale national effort to, to measure alkalinity at, at, uh, in coastal systems. Um, so if you have an alkalinity estimate from a source like that, you can basically draw a horizontal line against a figure like this and say, okay, well, if my pH measurements are in the, in the range of 7.6, then I'm approaching very stressful or corrosive conditions for, for example, for shellfish in, in, in my area. So that's an example of, of how pH data can be used to estimate aragonite saturation state to be fairly large uncertainty. If, if an approach like this was used. But then again, as a reminder, there's, there's also the kinds of insights that I described for Long Island Sound. So I just want to finish by talking about uh, the status of the guidelines. As I mentioned earlier, um, they, we're, ex we're expecting the hard copies, <coughs> excuse me, to arrive any minute. Um, and then soon, once the uh, the 508 compliance is done on the electronic version, and 508 refers to uh, accessibility of the document um, uh, for uh, disabled. But it basically derives from the Disabilities Act. Um, we've got requirements on making the document uh, readable in certain ways. Once that is done, the electronic version will also be posted online, and we expect that to happen any day. Um, so I think, oh, so, so in the meantime, um, one of the sources you can use for EPA publications is this National Service Center for Environmental Publications. It's got the website here. If you put in this uh, document number into that search, right now it comes up empty. But as soon as the, the document is available online, it should lead you to, to these guidelines. And that's all I had. Thank you. And, and um, I'd also, you know, this is an opportunity for also for Adam to chime in if if, Adam, if you, you know, want to point out anything else or think of anything that I didn't explain well. Thanks. All right. Can uh, everybody hear me? Yep. Um, yep. We can hear you, Adam. You're all set. Great. Great. Um, so my name is Adam Pimento. I've been working with Jason Greer measuring parameters of the seawater carbonate system, uh, primarily in Narragansett Bay. We've also been measuring biological activity in nutrient concentrations and looking at the relationship between those and the seawater carbonate system. So as Jason had mentioned, these guidelines are meant to be a resource for learning about and performing measurements of the seawater carbonate system, uh, especially as they relate to coastal acidification. And because the state of the science is changing so rapidly, and there also exists a wide range of acceptable and tested procedures. Uh, this document is not meant to be prescriptive. So the purpose that we hope to, to do is to give an overview of available sampling, analytical, and data reporting approaches that will contribute to the usefulness of coastal acidification measurements. And this kind of kind of uh, has grown out of our personal experience trying to adapt open ocean methods to estuarine systems. Um, you know, in the literature, there hasn't been very many procedures geared toward estuarine work. Um, there has been a greater amount of coastal acidification work for a longer period 
the time on the West Coast. However, there are you know unique drivers of acidification between the two coasts. Um, so I guess a few things I'd want to point out, um, we just already touched on some of these a bit, is, uh, you know, we really want users of the document to be aware of, um, you know, a really interesting aspect of the seawater carbonate system, and uh, that is by measuring only two of the parameters, along with um, combining that with high quality measurements of, you know, field temperature and salinity. Uh, you can then use a carbonate chemistry calculation program. Uh, three of the main ones are CO2, SYS, uh, C carb, and I believe Ocean Data View also has a carbonate chemistry calculation system. Uh, you can calculate out the remainder of uh, the carbonate system. So if you measure dissolved inorganic carbon and alkalinity and then combine that with temperature and salinity, that it then gives you uh, PCO2 concentrations, pH concentrations, as well as uh, calcite and aragonite saturation states, which are very important to many of the user groups on this uh, call. Um, so Jason, I've mentioned the uh, bottle sampling checklist, and that's, that's one area where uh, this document seeks to facilitate the development of you know, a more uniform methodology. Uh, bottle sampling, collection, and handling is one area um, that is within reach for almost all of the potential users of this document. It's an often overlooked part of water quality chemistry. And we go into detail about the preferred order of sample collection, different sampling equipment and containers, sample preservation, short and long-term storage. Uh, and we hope to go into uh, a bit more detail on, uh, on bottle handling and bottle sampling during the, during the workshops that are upcoming. Another area that we try to stress is um, the availability and the usage of certified reference materials. So certified reference materials have been shown to dramatically improve measurement precision and accuracy. They've been in use um, widely in oceanographic research since about 1990. And um, currently, Andrew Dixon out of uh, the University of California, San Diego, provides these certified reference materials for dissolved inorganic carbon and alkalinity. These are kind of the industry standard for tracing. Simple QA and organic carbon system analyses for now. And so we just try to stress um, the usefulness of using certified reference materials and um, how they should be input into runs for dissolved in organic carbon or alkalinity and the like. And uh, then this document gives an overview for each parameter to uh, be measured. And this shows the uh, pluses, the minuses, the equipment needs, and other considerations. You know, for example, there's an overview section for colorimetric DIC analysis as compared to DIC analysis using infrared detection. You know, for me personally, prior to writing this document, I didn't quite realize how crucial temperature control was. Um, for for all the different analyses in the labs. And so that's something that we've really uh, tried to improve at our lab. And for each of these uh, for each of these parameters to be measured, we go over the background and description of the method, as well as the history and supporting documentation. Um, benefits and disadvantages, including method precision, um, what the expected analysis time is. Um, estimated unit costs for the lab equipment, what supporting documentation is out there, the availability and identification of certified reference materials, and other method-specific concerns. So, um, yeah, I will, that's about all I had to say on the document for now, so I will uh, mute my microphone and listen in.
Great. Thanks so much, Adam, um, for going over the details. And, and the, one of the questions we've gotten the most of, as I'm sure everyone can imagine, is uh, how to access these documents. Um, Jason covered that at the very end of his uh, talk. Um, but we just want to emphasize that as soon as that link is active, we will send an email to everyone who's registered for this webinar with that link. And again, it should be in the next few weeks because there's a tremendous amount of interest uh, in these in these guidelines. Um, so that was the, the first and most common question that we got. I want to jump into your questions. And again, if you have additional questions for Adam or Jason, um, however minute or, or overview, please type them in and we will post them to, uh, to Jason and Adam. Um, first from Stena Troyer, uh, we have the question, Thinking about meeting the weather objective, weather quality data objective, how feasible is bottle sampling in the field without being associated with a competent lab? And would a Lamotte col uh, colorimeter be an acceptable device for measuring pH? Jason, go ahead. Um, so yeah, the, so the bottle sampling, um, <clears throat> I, 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 I realize now I wasn't clear about this. Um, the bottle sampling, is normally if you're in, if you have the ability to run a, a an alkalinity titration or a dissolved in organic carbon analysis in a laboratory and usually requires preserving the sample um, there is not an established protocol for using a sample like that to estimate pH uh, you know a bottle sample um, especially if it's an unpreserved sample um, so normally if you're going to to do a measurement of pH in a, from a you know from a field setting, it would be an instantaneous pH measurement. Um, I, I should point out I'm not familiar with the instrument that you mentioned. Adam may know something about it, but I'm also hearing that some of the um, the the technology that's used for high quality pH measurements, for example, you know, for example, the spectrophotometer that involves the use of a dye, uh, is being sort of miniaturized and and developed for handheld use. Um, and we're all in the community waiting to see how those uh, turn out to perform. Um, another possibility um, is that we that we talk about is the DuraFET sensor, which is a, 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 an alternative to the glass electrode pH sensors that is much more stable than a when, once calibrated hangs on to its calibration a little bit longer than a, a glass electrode. So probably a little more than what you're looking for on uh, an answer to that question, but I guess I can't really address that specific instrument. Great, thanks so much. Um, we have a question from Alexis Valari Orton, um, who also reminds everyone to join the OA Info Exchange, um, where there's a forum on low-cost OA monitoring kits. And Alexis asks, what are your thoughts on the qualifications needed to handle mercuric chloride, which is a, a, a poison? Is this safe for citizen science? Well, we this is uh, one of the reasons I, I mentioned um, in my presentation that EPA is looking at doing alkalinity measurements and trying to improve some of the models that are used for estimating alkalinity on a local scale. Right now, the you can estimate salinity from sal, excuse me alkalinity from salinity, but that estimation is is only really supportable in the open ocean environment. And um, but people are working on trying to come up with ways to estimate alkalinity in the coastal environment using you know proxy measurements and the reason why that helps to address the, the concern that you're raising is that if we are able to provide an alkalinity measurement and then there are people out getting pH measurements directly then hopefully those two kinds of measurements can combine be combined for at least an approximation of, of local carbonate chemistry. But you do re bring up a really vexing problem, um, you know, with all of the sort of capabilities that we have in analyzing carbonate chemistry and all the innovations that emerge, this one simple problem of, of preserving a field sample still, still persists. And there has been some discussion, actually what I would point you to is the discussion on the, um, on the information exchange about this this very problem, the question has now been posed, and it's widely recognized that it's a, a major impediment to doing some of these observations in the coastal environment. Um, when we ha handle mercuric chloride, 
<clears throat> you know, we there's there's there are various types of personal you know safety equipment that that that's involved. You're right that that it's it's uh, something that requires a lot of care. I don't think it's reasonable to expect people operating in small boats and estuaries or even uh, you know a citizen science environment where there might be people with no training involved in doing it. I I think that's a major concern. Um, but again, what we're 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 looking at is whether there are ways to get around that need for preservation by doing things like alkalinity, which is more stable in samples that haven't been preserved. You have a little bit more time to do the analysis without preservation, um, and then also doing things like uh, you know developing collaborations. Another concern about uh, preserving samples with mercuric chloride is that. If you're involved in any of the analysis, you also have to have the ability to handle the waste. Um, you know, a sample that's analyzed for mercuric mer mer chloride pr usually produces waste that is both corrosive and contaminated with mercury, um, and you have to have a way of dealing with that. Um, so, so it is it it is a, a significant issue. I don't know if there's a a, a solution in sight. Great, thanks so much, Jason, for talking us through that. Um, we have a, a request, and I'll, I'll make you presenter again to put up the slide with the document number uh, one more time. Sure. Um, and in the meantime, there's a, another question. Um, Dan McCorkle says, nice talk, Jason. Um, what are some thoughts on best practices for replication and approaches to intercalibration? It's been mentioned a few times how much of do the guidelines speak to that and and how important you know how do we get to that that quality intercalibration that you mentioned several times in your talk uh yeah that's a great question and well first let me start by oops hold on a second let me show my screen here um can you guys see that oops what hold on okay um so the the document number should be showing up there um so that is i i i kind of see that as sort of the longer term objective of this whole effort um including the, both the guidelines and the workshops and these webinars is to sort of set the stage for that kind of thing the closest we get to that issue in the guidelines is to talk about the importance of using reference materials um you know to make uh some of the bottle sample analyses comparable uh between uh different monitoring programs but as far as um, how to how to achieve that um, how to do intercalibration um, I'm afraid it's we're, uh, we're kind of silent on that I think uh, but that is the direction that I think everybody wants to go and we hope that um, these guidelines help make that happen as, as well as the workshop so sorry Dan that's not a great answer Great, and th thanks for that. And I'll just note that part of the goal of this um, grant from the Ocean Acidification Program that's putting on these webinars is to build a community of practice, both through the OA Intro Exchange and in the Northeast region, um, so that we can start connecting research labs, citizen science groups, and hatcheries together, um, both through future upcoming workshops, but as, as well as just getting to know some of the other people who are thinking about this because of how important that is for laying the groundwork for effective um, intercalibration. We have a, a, another follow-on question. Um, the required uncertainty for pH measurement needed to accompany unpreserved alkalinity bottle samples. Um, it's a pretty precise question. Any, any thoughts on sort of for unpreserved alkalinity bottle samples, uh, what's required for, for pH measurement? Um, well, it would still, it, it, it's kind of the, the the uncertainty objectives are kind of independent of the method. If 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 your goal is to achieve a, a, a certain level of uncertainty, if you can do it with a bottle sample, go for it. But I think that, you know, the consensus is that that's pretty hard to do. Um, in other words, like, for example, to know how good your bottle sample is, you have to know what the pH conditions were in situ where you grabbed that that pH sample, um, and, and and you know to sort of be able to assess that methodology. Um, so I'm I'm we we generally don't do that kind of thing. We don't grab bottle samples and then 
and then do a pH analysis unless we're grabbing the bottle sample literally here in the lab. Um, you know, sometimes we have experiments going on with our flow through seawater systems. We'll grab a, 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 a sample for pH and run it down to the spectrophotometer and run the analysis. Um, but ideally, I, I think that the problem of, you know, the instability of a pH sample um, is better addressed by um, using methods that do an, inst you know, an instant, like a handheld DuraFET or a very, very well calibrated glass electrode or some of the, you know, commercially available autonomous sensors. Um, and then, of course, there's the problem of, you know, once you start getting into lower salinity waters, say below 20 parts per thousand, getting a good pH measurement becomes even more difficult and that starts to put you into the realm where you want to be considering other other types of measurements like a, C, a PCO2 measurement, at least for now. Um, there is work underway um, on sort of standardizing some of the pH measurements and, and developing, um, you know, the you know, NIST criteria or NIST, uh, I forget what that stands for, the Bureau of Standards basically criteria for uh, for measuring pH. But um, yeah, I, I think that um, the, the, you, you have to think about the, the weather and climate objectives of, as being independent of the actual method. Great, thanks so much. We have a question from Jason Masteris, um, who says, I already have a YSI 5200A with pH and dissolved oxygen I can put into service as a continuous measuring platform at either my hatchery at the other end of Long Island or at another hatchery on the north shore of Long Island. Is there an initiative to purchase more flow-through sensors to deploy at sites of interest? Well, as far as what EPA is involved in, um, one of the things that ha is, is underway is that um, EPA has been providing capital support to some of the national estuary programs who are who have expressed interest in monitoring pH at their sites. So those national estuary programs are fairly few and far between. But um, I would also add that um, NOAA um, has a, a, a very extensive network of national estuarine research reserves, and they have a, a, a kind of a more standardized protocol for measuring pH. They've been doing this for a number of years, um, and I think that a lot of their sites use instrumentation that's not terribly different from what you just described. Um, so that's another thing to look for is to look at um, where the National, National Estuarine Research Reserve sites are in relation to where you are. Um, but as far as uh, efforts to install, you know, monitoring assets like, um, you know, the, the buoys that you sometimes see at the mouth of an estuary or whatever, um, that's just kind of case by case. Um, I'm not aware of a large concerted effort to increase that kind of instrumentation. Great. Thanks so much. And we... Uh, we had a couple questions for asking for clarification on these workshops that have been referred to, and I can jump in there. Um, there are state-based uh, training workshops that are being set up for groups based in the Northeast in Connecticut, Massachusetts, and Maine that are actively engaged this summer in water quality monitoring and are interested in getting additional training. Um, I think some people on the call have already been contacted about those workshops. Um, but if you would like more information about those, the sort of next phase of um, sort of uh, direct and more intimate training um, on the guidelines, uh, please reach out either to myself, Aaron Strong, that's A-A-R-O-N dot S-T-R-O-N-G at Maine dot E-D-U, or Parker Gassett, P-A-R-K-E-R dot G-A-S-S-E-T-T, -T, and we'll send that information out. Um, but please, uh, if, if you are, are actively in the Northeast considering monitoring pH um, or other carbonate chemistry parameters um, and would like to be engaged, um, feel free to, to reach out. Um, so we're almost at 11 o'clock, and that is the, the, the sum total of, of questions that we've received. I want to recap a few things. Uh, Jason and Adam did a wonderful job. Uh, introducing these new EPA guidelines to us. They're gonna be an incredible resource um, for many, many different groups, hatcheries, industry members, uh, uh, people working in agencies, 
um, and citizen science monitoring groups for moving towards standardizing protocols uh, for monitoring carbonate chemistry parameters, um, which are so critical for addressing the challenge of ocean and coastal acidification. Uh, as Jason said, they'll be released soon. Um, we expect very, very soon. And as soon as those are publicly available, we'll make them available to uh, everyone who's uh, been on the webinar um, by providing the link to you. Uh, in the meantime, if you have additional questions for Jason um, or for Jackie about NECAN or NIRACUS, um, please don't hesitate to reach out. And again, we invite everyone to join the uh, OA Information Exchange that we referred to earlier. This is really a kind of online portal for groups that are actively engaging with acidification questions and will be really the forum through which um, we can share more and more information and details about uh, monitoring protocols and monitoring approaches. So Jason, any, uh, any final words you want to share with everyone before we sign off right at the hour? No, I don't think so. Just, uh, just thank you. Thank you for, to everyone for participating. And thank you, Aaron, and the other organizers for putting this together. Appreciate it. Well, it wouldn't be without the hard work of you and Adam over these last few years um, to really put together a resource that's going to be invaluable to everyone working on this problem. So thank you all for joining this morning uh, and have a wonderful April 18th. Um, thanks again to Jason and Adam and Jackie and to the whole uh, mini grant team from the Ocean Acidification Project. We look forward to interacting with many of you more in the future. All right. Thanks so much. Thank you.